Cumbria, an area of outstanding natural beauty. Home to the Lake District National Park, currently under consideration for World Heritage status. For generations, it's inspired painters, poets and artists of all descriptions. It's exhilarated a multitude of adventurers and outdoor enthusiasts, from potholers to paragliders, and provided the perfect getaway for those everyday folk seeking to clear the mind and recharge the batteries. But while holidaymakers visit to enjoy the landscape, many local communities owe their very existence to it and to the natural resources that it yields. Communities like Brigham, where a settlement has existed since Neolithic times, with evidence of both farming and quarrying dating from that period right up to the present day. Nowadays, Brigham is more of a residential area, with most people working in the industry and commerce of the wider locale, most notably the Sellafield Nuclear Facility, where many Brigham residents are employed. Much of Brigham's character was shaped during the 19th century at the height of the Industrial Revolution, when the world's appetite for raw materials was voracious, and the limestone quarries and their proximity to the railway brought prosperity to the village. This map from 1864 shows the quarries and the number of lime kilns which baked the limestone to produce quicklime. The Lime Kiln Inn is also marked a favourite destination for thirsty workers. Men like William Fletcher, pictured here on the left outside his residence, Hill House, were well placed to profit from this demand. And as a coal mine owner and railway deputy chairman, he led a very comfortable life. In stark contrast, many people's lives were characterised by great physical and financial hardship. And despite the boom, poverty was rife. From these 19th century photos, of a Brigham quarry, it's easy to imagine the discomfort and relentless toil of the men who worked there. While Hill House remains much the same, the quarries themselves have experienced mixed fortunes, with some abandoned and completely overgrown, but others transformed and repurposed. This old quarry was flooded and fish stock introduced, breathing new life into it and attracting both local and visiting anglers. Another old quarry site now accommodates this holiday park. It seems a peculiar quirk of fate that the scene of such arduous labour was now a haven of relaxation and ease. And though elsewhere the toil continues, mechanisation has all but eradicated the sheer physical grind endured by previous generations of quarrymen. Falling within the same parish, neighbouring village Graysoon has a rich farming heritage with several small farms dotted in and around the village still worked today. Its industrial heritage is one of coal mining, with five pits active in 1845. Farm buildings were converted into cottages for the miners as the workforce expanded. The mansion house was once owned by Joseph Harris, Esquire, a prominent businessman and local benefactor with various commercial interests. He was held in high esteem by his workforce and was a man of deep religious conviction. This building was once the Punch Bowl Inn. More than just a pub, it was the hub of community life. It was said that the miners of Graysoon prized their ale above all else. Another significant local figure was Isaac Fletcher of Tarn Bank, a colliery owner, magistrate, MP, railway director and church warden. He was also a member of the Astronomical Society, building his own observatory, the black domed structure on the right, thought to be one of the oldest in England. In 1863, Isaac, along with his brother William of Hill House Brigham, opened the Melgram Fitz Pit, in an effort to attract more miners to boost production, he built 20 stone cottages, 10 for the day shift, 10 for the night shift. The miners would walk down here 
and make their way in to this entrance. Then follow the track that would lead them around to the other side of those trees. Horses and carts would have hauled coal up here regularly to satisfy a healthy local demand. The A66 now follows what was once the Cockermouth to Workington railway line. A siding allowed coal to be loaded directly onto trains to supply both national and international markets. The miners would make their way into the mine in the area of those stones, which are all that remain of the Melbourne Fitz pit. It's a sobering thought to reflect on the men who would descend underground, never to return to the surface alive. Men like David Roper and William Souter laid to rest here at St Bridget's Church. Sitting on the floodplain of the River Derwent, St Bridget's has been at the heart of the community for centuries. Thought to have been a site of worship since 500 AD, the current building started life as a small Norman church, evolving through a series of expansions and restorations into the structure we see today. The oldest masonry, dating from Norman times, is found in this arch seen here an assembly of carved stones dating mostly from the 10th and 11th centuries and of Anglo-Saxon design can be seen in the South Isle. Along with other stonework of differing periods and refinement found along the walls. There's also work of Anglo-Scandinavian influence. Within the churchyard are some unusual and beautifully carved gravestones. Fletcher Christian of Mutiny on the Bounty fame, was christened in St Bridget's in 1764. This is his family's tomb. Fletcher was at school with the poet William Wordsworth, whose son, John Wordsworth, was vicar of St Bridget's for some 40 years. On one visit to see his son, William was inspired to write the sonnet Nuns Well, Brigham. The main east window is dedicated to the memory of John Wordsworth and his wife Isabella, a representation of the Ascension. It's by Alexander Gibbs. Jeremy Pollock, another vicar of 40 years standing, was commemorated by this window, while the workers of both Joseph and John Harris and Grey Soon paid for windows in their memory. The ceilings are designed by William Butterfield, a celebrated and influential architect of the day. A member of the Ecclesiological Society, he was a particularly serious man with a very personal philosophy about church design. Butterfield had been active in the area building St Michael's Church at Lampler and renovating the Tower of St Bees Priory, a spectacular building of medieval origin. This ornate screen and everything behind it is Butterfield's work, the flamboyant use of colour being one of his trademarks not always to everyone's taste. Butterfield restored St Bridget's twice, in 1864, adding a saddleback roof and heightening the rooms of the nave, chancel and lady chapel. And again in 1874, when the chancel was restored, an organ chamber built, a new window put in and a host of other improvements made. Though Butterfield had his critics, he also had admirers, many of whom thought his work to be timeless but however timeless his designs may be, nothing lasts forever. Derek Bainbridge takes up the story. So in 2006, we had a leak in the roof, uh, which caused water damage to some areas of Butterfield ceiling panels in both the nave and Lady Chapel, and to both ends of two of the roof trusses. Through a mixture of available grants and fundraising, the cost of repairing these was met fairly quickly, and the repairs carried out. As a result of the repairs, a number of panels and areas of wood were left bare and in need of redecoration, the cost of which was initially estimated to be around £10,000. Sadly, an underestimate. And so a major fundraising effort started. With a continuous reading of the King James Bible in its 400th anniversary year, a team of people reading 24 hours a day for over three and a half days raised something in excess of £8,000. A ceiling survey was commissioned, with its subsequent report detailing three options. Firstly, we could repaint the areas to match the current condition. Secondly, we could repaint the areas in their original colours. Or thirdly, to 
clean, stabilize, restore, and repaint the missing areas. It didn't take long for the parochial church council to decide on option three, the full shebang. But at a cost of £38,000, it was back to fundraising, with the Heritage Lottery Fund identified as the probable benefactor. An application was submitted in late 2012, but subsequently rejected. It was suggested to us, however, that it would be worthy of resubmission with more church funding and community involvement. Additional community activities would ensure greater participation and opportunities for learning, something the Heritage Lottery Fund were keen on, while the fundraising efforts of the team significantly reduced the size of the grant we were looking for. On resubmitting in early 2013, we were delighted to hear that our application had been successful, as was the Bishop of Carlisle, the Reverend James Newcomb. My name is James Newcomb, I'm Bishop of Carlisle, and there are three reasons why this project is so important and so exciting for me and for the whole of the Diocese of Carlisle. And the first is because this is a very important part of our cultural heritage. There are quite a number of very old and very beautiful churches in Cumbria. St Bridget's is one of them. And that's why I'm so thrilled that a group of people have got together, put in a tremendous amount of time and effort to raise so much money and are engaged on this wonderful work of restoration. I'm also very grateful to the Heritage Lottery Fund, among others, for providing such a generous grant towards the work. Uh, the second reason why this is so significant is because this building belongs to and brings together the community. It's something which, as a church, it's been doing for many hundreds of years. And it's wonderful to see the way in which a whole team of people have been working together on the restoration project and will be working together too uh, with a whole variety of creative gifts which are being used to the glory of God and for the further beautification of this place. The third reason why it's so important is because this church, this church building, is a sign of God's presence here in Brigham and a witness to the Christian faith. For many hundreds of years, the Christian faith has been practiced and lived out here. People have worshipped here. And as a result of this restoration project, they will go on doing so in beautiful surroundings. We hope for many more hundreds of years to come. So the work commenced in mid-September 2013 with the arrival of the scaffolding, which was up in no time and completely filled the nave and lady chapel. It provided us with a ladder to see the magnitude of the job and in readiness for the arrival of the conservators. A team from Hearst Conservation arrived, got stuck into the task of cleaning. 150 years of grime, painstakingly removed by hand. We'd been informed that the ceilings weren't only of architectural significance because they were designed by William Butterfield, but because they were painted on plaster panels rather than wooden ones, which would have been the norm for that period. Though these features further strengthened our determination to preserve them, it was also a contributory factor in their demise, as with both paint and plaster being water-based, the effect of the leak was seen to be much greater. Given their vulnerability to moisture, a dry cleaning method was required. Camille, from the Hearst's team, explains. Dry cleaning is a process where when you use different sponges or art gums to, to take the, the dirt from, from any object like uh, plasterboards or wooden panel. In this case, uh, we found out that uh, the best method to, to remove the surface dirt is to use a uh, uh, Wishab sponge. It's, it's a very special sponge that is made of um, kind of synthetic uh, material and there are different grades of the, of the sponge and we're using um, medium or hard sponge that, is, uh, that enables you to, to remove the dirt. So after many man hours of elbow grease, the dirt had been removed and a brighter and more vibrant ceiling revealed. All that was left to do 
was to check that no bits had been missed. While the light showed up a small patch here or there, it also revealed the odd surprise. We found a writing from painters in 1896, I believe, uh, with the names and with the dates. And this is something that I come across very often and uh, I found it fascinating when, when I discover that some, some Arthur or Peter was here and he was doing exactly the same type of work that I'm doing now. So uh, I'm going obviously to, to leave my little mark and, and sign it for future people who, who are going to restore it to see. They weren't the only ones to make their mark. Publicised through local networks, a series of calligraphy workshops were held, giving local people an opportunity to get to grips with pen and paper to acquire skills in penmanship. The classes proved popular, with examples of their work exhibited at the open day. Meanwhile, the village quilting group were approached to design a wall hanging for the church. They decided to use the art of Butterfield ceiling as inspiration. Using every person's particular skills, they produced the many component parts. In particular, they wanted to incorporate the many rose centre forms. Then came the day of assembly. Back at the church, work had progressed to the stabilisation phase. Lucy takes up the story and tells us about it. Uh, the ceiling is uh, painted uh, in a technique which is uh, water-based and glue-bound. Uh, so the paint is soluble in water, which makes uh, stabilisation more challenging because uh, the media we are using must be compatible with, uh, with the original media. So we were using a protein-based glue. We used isinglass, which is uh, fish glue. Uh, which is um, obtained from swim bladders of fish and uh, it needs an appropriate temperature to be used so it's, it's quite a sensitive uh, adhesive, a sensitive media. So at the first stage we were using that uh, by spraying and injections to, uh, to keep the, the flaking paint or powdering paint in place. And this was followed by the second phase, which is already proper conservation work. Yes, and um, the aim of our works that we are doing here are to um, preserve what is left, what is in remarkably good condition, without changing it by any means or, or damaging it, uh, to keep it a condition as we found it and to, to keep it for future generations. Speaking of future generations, at the local village school, in their own time, both primary and secondary students develop their own interpretation of William Butterfield's ceiling art. A discussion with teacher, words of encouragement and some fun are an important part of that development. Meanwhile, in a village hall, the adult artists were engaged in similar activities. The group leader, Trish, visited the church taking photographs. These photographs, Trish's ideas and different techniques were used by the group to produce their own interpretations of the ceiling's art. With considerably less scope for interpretation, the conservators continued to recreate Butterfield's work as accurately as possible. The paints that were originally used uh, is distemper. So we decided to use exactly the same kind of, pa uh, of paint. And um, distemper itself, uh, it's a very basic and very simple paint to make. It's water-based, uh, paint that consists of uh, chalk and the binding agent medium is uh, skin glue. So you add skin glue, water and chalk together, well you mix it together and hey presto you got stamper paint. 
Later, obviously, you need to add some pigments to colour it. And here, we, we've matched the colour to, to the background, uh, which was quite hard to do because the amount of pigment that is required to, to match it is, is enormous. Um, the stamper is, um, is kind of paint that dries differently on different backgrounds. And here, on, on this project, we are faced with, uh, you know, different areas and different surfaces that we have to paint. Sometimes it's totally new uh, reconstructed wood or plaster, and sometimes we need to touch it in with uh, original paint. So uh, that's what is challenging, and we, we have to fiddle with the paint all the time. After we aligned uh, and decided where exactly to put our stencils, uh, we used different uh, colours of distemper uh, just to stipple it in onto the background. And step by step and colour by colour, um, the original pattern has been recreated. As you can see, there are some flakes and water damage to the ceiling, and the, the paint has lost uh, adherence to, um, to the background. So what we need to do is to inject some kind of consolidant, which you may call glue, um, to put it back onto, uh, onto the background. Before you inject any consolidant, which is usually water-based glue, you need to um, inject some alcohol to decrease the surface tension. You can follow that with injecting glue, and once you inject glue, you, you can just leave it and the flake will uh, be glued to the background. When, when the distemper is applied on, on the background, uh, we follow that with reconstruction of the original pattern, uh, which we decided to, to reproduce using stencils and uh, tracing paper. It's very hard to match the distemper itself, because it consists of, of a great amount of chalk. So every colour you're trying to mix, dries as a very pastel-like colour that, that, that is not very saturated. In my opinion, this is a very interesting project. Um, uh, first of all, it has survived in most than 95% of the original. Uh, so you can see exactly how, how it was made, how it was painted uh, nearly 150 years ago. And working here gives you a very nice perspective of craftsmanship that it was used here. And also, the distemper technique is very typical for that time, uh, of, well, for the time of, in history of art and for this artist. We're using we're using dry pastels to blend in with uh, original background colour because it's the um, best way to to match the original colour and try to blend it in with. Uh, uh, with the new with the new paint scheme, you know, as long as it's, you know we're achieving what we're delivering, what we were asked to, I think we're very fortunate, and uh, the people will see how how we <laughs> how we've managed. <laughs> I hope we managed good. <laughs> as with those before, the conservators sign to signify the end of the restoration. Who I wonder will find this in another 150 years. The job complete, only the packing to do. The conservators can return to Lincoln with our thanks and in the knowledge of a job well done. So we say au revoir and safe journey to them. We look forward to their return on open day. An open day was held for the community to mark the end of the work, an opportunity to view the ceiling meeting people and talking about today's experiences. Archives of the late 1800s, rarely seen, are available to peruse, stimulating great interest and discussion, as well as John Wordsworth's burial register, his and his son's name occur in other registers. Artifacts and images from the more recent times were also on display. There were refreshments and a cake. The conservators involving visitors in their activities.
the wall hanging, a fitting representation of the quilter's talents. A copy of the beams led stars. Everyone's mark in their own style. The work completed, a lasting memory to those who have gone before. In the evening of the open day, James Perry, a postgraduate MA history student from Lancaster University, delivered his presentation on Brigham and Grace Soon, our Victorian ancestors who shaped the parish. We had approached Lancaster University to carry out some research for us. James's interests lay in the socio-economic circumstances of 19th century West Cumbria. His presentation was based upon the original subscription list for the Butterfield Restoration. He selected a, a variety of benefactors and described their lives. It was well received and prompted questions and discussion over wine and nibbles afterwards. Attendees agreed that it had been a most interesting and informative insight into those times. The significance of restoring Butterfield's homage was encapsulated in the rededication service by Bishop James. As he put it, for me, the annual church sermon is up there with a yearly lecture from my accountant on self assessment. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the faith of Christ, and for the benefit of his holy church, we rededicate this ceiling to the glory of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is my mother.